Michael, uh, thanks all of you uh, for, for joining us today um, for what should be a really interesting session. And I think the idea is to, and we already started to hear about some of these ideas during the discussion earlier um, at our main panel, um, but the idea now is to sort of dive a level deeper uh, on these questions of ISIS, Iraq, Syria, and it's, it's incredibly rich. There's so much going on. Um, you know, I think what we'll do is, Nick, I wanted to start with you um, and really start, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about, and, and actually I've spoken with Kim about this also, you know, the, this idea that you, know, you have Iraq and Syria, uh, but actually the way to really think about it is sort of two separate theaters of conflict. One is what you'd call sort of the ISIS Dan theater of conflict. This is um, really, you know, Western Iraq and Eastern Syria. And then separate from that, you have this, Syrian civil war, which isn't really about ISIS, it's about all these other actors and Bashar al-Assad, Iran and Russia and everybody else um, in that western half of the country. Um, and so I want to sort of treat each one of these two theaters starting separately. Um, so Nick, I want to start with you and maybe to dive into quote unquote ISIS, Dan, into what's going on in western Iraq and eastern Syria. You know, Raqqa just fell a few days ago. Uh, Mosul fell over the past few months. Um, and so ISIS is now isolated and really hanging out in this area called the Deir Azur that you've spent a lot of time researching and looking at probably more deeply than anybody, at least certainly any American. Um, you know, but as ISIS goes away and as we look at this sort of end game, um, you know, what should we be looking at? What should we be worrying about? Um, and how do we make sure that ISIS actually really does go away? and that we don't just end up with, a few years from now, another problem again, because all ISIS really is is, you know, ISIS just was another version of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that existed 10 years ago, and for a number of reasons just came back. So how do we make sure we just don't end up in another war in the Middle East in 2020 dealing with the same problem? Well, thank you, Elon, and thank you, everyone, for being here in attendance. I would start by saying that, you know, step one, was, it would be uh, for the Trump administration to outline what its vision is for Syria. Um, at the moment, there is a need for a serious strategy, and there is a... Is the mic on? You hear me better now? Okay. At, at the moment, there's a need for a serious strategy because the U.S. has a real equity via the counter-ISIS campaign in the future of Syria. Uh, as you mentioned, Ilan, Raqqa has fallen. Uh, the U.S. working by, with, and through local Syrian partners has really collapsed ISIS's caliphate, its, its core area of control in Syria and Iraq, which has, was his main propaganda um, uh, pledge to try to be sort of a leadership of the broader Salafist jihadist movement. That's been a success. Uh, what is less clear is what does the U.S. intend to do with the success? How does the U.S. intend to work with local Syrian partners to build the security structure that is necessary to lead to governance, rule of law, and economic reconstruction of these areas that have been taken from ISIS? Um, that is going to be a big challenge. If you see the images that come from Raqqa, you see absolute destruction, you see an absolute loss of services, and the problem is, is that throughout northern and eastern Syria, where ISIS has been removed, the same challenge remains. There are tens of billions of dollars of reconstruction that needs to be done. There are local councils that need to be stood up, and there are partners that to be leveraged. And the problem is, the actors on our ground are Syrian partners, the broader regional allies that we work with, whether it's Turkey, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and others, and even our adversaries, the Assad government, Iran, and Russia, don't know what the U.S. intends to do. And so long as there is a question mark about whether the U.S. intends to stay for some sort of interim period to help build stability in areas taken from ISIS, there is a real threat of ISIS instituting an insurgency against the U.S. and its partners and drawing us further into this situation. So just to follow up on that, Nick, do you see at least any indicators so far that we're taking this sort of phase four plan, this next phase, that's maybe the most important phase, seriously? And sort of what would be your, if you had a couple of things to recommend to the U.S. government that we should do to like really deal with this issue, like what would you recommend? First things first, I would say roll out a serious strategy. I think that's just the cornerstone of everything. Second thing, I would, 
I would advocate that the U.S. begin to think seriously about what this buzzword, interim stability, you've probably heard in the media, the administration has said, the intention after ISIS is to build interim stability. We'll define what that means. What does that mean in terms of security? What does that mean in terms of governance? And really, what does that mean with what you intend to do with the broader Syria situation? If, in fact, the goal is not to have the Assad government stay in power in Damascus, and the goal is to not have ISIS return, then the U.S. needs to begin to build out the infrastructure to attract the billions of dollars that are needed for reconstruction, and to seriously think about what are the local partners that can provide sustainable security. So step one, I say, is make Raqqa a showcase. Show what can be done in Raqqa to rebuild it, to build out local, truly inclusive governance, and to really think through how the reconstruction of Raqqa and other areas taken from ISIS built into a broader strategy of making sure Syria isn't a long-term safe haven for jihadists and other actors. Okay, so I want to sort of shift the conversation, and we will be going back and forth between East and West, um, but I want to shift the conversation a little bit West, because ISIS is what we spend so much of our time talking about here in the United States as the main focus. Um, but there is Western Syria, which in many ways, you know, you heard Prince Turkey, like that's what his focus was. It wasn't really about ISIS, it was about Damascus, Kim. Um, you know, and it was about the fact that we have, you know, we have this ISIS-held territory in the East, we have a Kurdish region sort of in the Northeast that we're, that the U.S. is supporting. Then we have a Turkish region right on the northern border where the Turks have invaded. An Al-Qaeda region in the Northwest, the major part of the country is still Damascus, Aleppo. These big cities are held now by, by the regime with support from Russia and Iran. And we also have this sort of moderate force where we're trying to negotiate some kind of, uh, you know, um, de-escalation zone in the southwest, which borders on Israel's border. So that is a really chaotic situation, much of which has nothing to do with ISIS. Um, and so far, we've chosen not to really militarily intervene in a significant way, but we are going to need to get that piece right, too, and help them get that piece right. So what should we be doing in, in western Syria? Easy, simple question for you, Kim. Sure, I'll have it. Just solve that one for us, please. I'll have it taken. There we yes. go. I'll have it taken care of for you in, in five minutes. No. Um, look, the United States is a superpower, but we have been playing uh, the situation. Our, we've been following a policy in Syria that really has been one thing at a time. Uh, and the first thing that we did, very important thing, of course, uh, was to focus on ISIS and try to imagine that we could defeat ISIS and ignore uh, everything else that was happening all around Iraq and Syria. And that if we first solved the ISIS problem, uh, we could then move on uh, to addressing the challenge of the Assad regime, to addressing the challenge of Al-Qaeda, which has a strong, robust safe haven inside of Syria addressing the challenge of the Iranian regime, uh, which has military assets throughout Syria. Uh, and what we have done uh, through our single-minded pursuit of the defeat of ISIS is allow every other actor in the theater to set conditions uh, to meet their interests uh, at the expense of the United States of America and its security interests. So Iran has, over the course of the Syrian civil war, established a, a really interesting, capable, multinational force that is interoperable uh, with the Russians, with Hezbollah, with their Iraqi Shia militias, with Afghans, with Pakistanis. Uh, and it now has a coalition that, frankly, we would have been jealous uh, to have in Afghanistan. Uh, it is sufficiently functional and capable uh, and has sufficient military power uh, that it is able to pursue Iranian objectives throughout the breadth and depth of Syria. Um, that is an incredibly dangerous situation for the United States, and it's an incredibly dangerous situation for Israel. Uh, and that is uh, something with which the United States must contend right now. Um, one of the uh, strange facets, 
One of the strange facets of the current presidential administration is that President Trump has actually pursued much of President Obama's strategy inside of Syria. There's incredible continuity uh, between the two, ISIS first, ISIS first. Um, one of the strong differences uh, that President Trump has stated uh, is that he will push back on Iran. Uh, one of the realities is that Iranian influence uh, is really uh, what is keeping the Syrian regime together. Uh, and so one of the extraordinary things that we need to do in Western Syria right now uh, is see to it uh, that as we try to establish temporary peaceful areas, these de-escalation de zones, we don't actually create safe havens uh, for Iranian-backed elements such as the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Quds Force uh, or Hezbollah throughout the breadth and depth of Syria. We must push back on Iran and Syria. That's where it's vulnerable. Uh, that's where it's overextended. And that's where our allies are most threatened. The second thing that we need to do is take on Al Qaeda. Uh, Al Qaeda is actually a greater long term threat than ISIS to the United States and to the world. It maintains extraordinary capabilities. Uh, it has uh, a global contingent inside of Syria. And right now, uh, in the name of these de escalation zones, we're actually allowing uh, the Turks to come in and create uh, a border uh, in which. Um, they are safeguarding Al Qaeda. And Al Qaeda is reinforcing with international assets its extraordinary leadership from Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, in order to create a viable international terrorist threat from Syria. This isn't a next problem, this is a now problem. Uh, and the United States actually must engage on this militarily uh, as, well, uh, as well and soon, or else actually the new ISIS will be Al-Qaeda. That is to say, the new ISIS uh, is going to be the thing from which ISIS came. Well, well that's a lot to chew on. And I think I'm going to come back to you when we go through this some more and I ask you uh, how. <laughs> so that'll be my next big question. I'm just giving you that, 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 uh, that warning right now, Kim. But maybe before we do that, I wanted to head over to Udi um, and get his perspective on this. Um, and really sort of on the on the Israeli perspective, to start with in Syria, the concerns from Israel's national security perspective, I mean, on the one hand, you could say, look, if you were to tell me five years ago that Syria would absolutely collapse, you'd have hundreds of thousands of people dead and a massive refugee crisis. I mean, and Israel's security, on the one hand, you can say, well, actually, Israel's held up pretty well considering all of this. But on the other hand, I know there are major concerns, especially some of the points Kim raised about Iran. So I'd be interested to hear your perspective and also a little bit about how the U.S. and Israel can work together to deal with these questions, which is, I think, such an important one. Okay, thank you. Um, there is um, the noise here. It's not so clear, but I would like to say one word about the U.S. policy. No uh, strategy, yes, as you said. In the language of the Middle East, there is only one word, is betrayal. You know, you spoke about Raqqa. Who took over Raqqa? Kurdish forces, SDF, which is 80%. So the U.S. is going to support them or give Raqqa to Assad and the Iranian, which, which this is uh, now, we can see this is going to be the picture there, okay? Um, you cannot uh, deal in, in Syria by tweeting, yes? Uh, because uh, you cannot deal in the Middle East by tweeting. You know, in the Middle East, the, we understand, unfortunately, also Israel, only the language of power, the, langu the language of force, not the language of tweeting and saying things without any cover to the things which everybody says about the Middle East. So only those which have the, uh, uh, are ready to put their hands in the swamp of Syria have any influence upon the future of Syria. And as we see the situation, you know, Israel is in the same position now, because until now I'm going to Israel, as you asked me, because I have a lot of things to say about the other things. But uh, Israel decided not to intervene in the conflict, the civil war in Syria, because Israel knew that if Israel intervened, all the focus would change to the direction of Israel. 
And in some cases, I don't want to say it loud and clear, but it wasn't so bad for Israel that the bad guy is killing the other bad guys. Uh, and the only things that we decided to do is, if there is any imminent threat, to deal with the imminent threat. It can be terror attack toward Israel, it can be delivery of advanced weapon systems to Hezbollah, and other activity which was for us imminent threat to Israel. But we decided not to support Assad and not to support the others. And that was very clever policy until the new confrontation. We are now in a new confrontation, the confrontation of shaping the future of Syria. And in order to achieve any influence upon shaping the future of Syria, you have to put your hands in the Syrian swamp. And I assume that Israel will be more involved in the coming future. Because one of the things that we don't want to see is that there is any Iranian hegemony influence all over Syria. We don't want to see deployment of Iranian proxies, what you spoke about, uh, Shia militias. Uh, you know, Afghanis and Pakistan and from Iraq, of course, Hezbollah, uh, along the borders with us in the Golanites, because the Iranian would like to extend the area of friction with Israel. They don't, as uh, Ephraim Alevi said before, they, they understand that they don't have the ability to destroy Israel, but they, they have the ability to create situations which Israel is bleeding along the borders, and they try to do that. And in that case, we have to do something in order to prevent the Iranian hegemony and the Iranian deployment of proxies and services along of our borders. And this is now a key situation because, as we see now, the situation in the southern part of Syria, it's basically stable, more than other places. Even, you know, if you look upon the picture along of our borders, we can find the Jabhat Fatah al-Sham, which is an Al-Qaeda type organization. And in the southern part of the Golan Heights, you can find the Shuhada al-Yarmouk, which is an ISIS organization. They tried only one to attack Israel, and they got an answer which they understood the message, and they are not operating against Israel today. And this is the, this is the key issue. You know, somebody blame Israel that we have a some kind of connection with the Jabhat Fatah Hashem, which was Jabhat al-Nusra, which is an Al-Qaeda organization. But we have to understand something. There is a movement of people between all of those extreme organizations. One day they can be in Jabhat Fatah al-Nusra, the other day they can be in the ISIS, the other day they can move back to Jabhat Fatah, other Jabhat Fatah, never mind. So people uh, moving between the organizations, especially those which are part of the, what we call the Salafi Jihadi organization, because they want to, to be in, the, in the, power, the, the force or the actor which have more power. And today is Jabhat Fatah al-Asham. So in that case, we can see more and more volunteers moving from ISIS to this organization. And as long as, and this is the key issue, as long as Assad exists, those people will try to fight against Assad regime in Syria. As long as there is Iranian dominance in Syria, those extreme organizations will try to fight against Assad and the Iranian influence in Syria. So we will not see a calm situation. This is not the end of the war, as people used to say today. This is the new confrontation, as I said before. And the problem, there is so many flags so many flags in Syria today, Russia and the Turks and the Iranian and 200 organizations and maybe Israel and Hezbollah, and, but there is no one flag you cannot find in Syria today. This is the US flag. It does not exist in Syria today. Okay, after defeating, let's say, ISIS, there is no any real influence by the Americans. The US decided even this administration decided to give the Syrian portfolio to the Russians. The Russian managing all the things now in Syria, fighting and negotiating. Fighting, hitting, destroying, and then negotiating. There is no good result for negotiation, still starting again, fighting and negotiating. So uh, Israel have to, to understand what is the new balance of power. And that's the reason why Israel keep good a coordination with the Russians, 
uh, because the Russians have more influence than the Americans in Syria, so we have to keep good uh, contact with the Russians, not to be in any, we call it a deconfliction, not to be in kind of uh, conflict with the Russians, and, uh, but we have to, to think what we have to do the next day. And the next day we will see, coming days, that the Assad regime, with the support of the Iranian, will try to take over the southern part of Syria. This area is under the control of the rebels, many kinds of rebels, but mostly the, the Jabhat Fatah Hasham and, and the, what we call the Free Syrian Army. And now this is the key issue for Israel. If Israel stand, you know, as until now, sitting on the fence or in stand of position, not involved in the activity, or Israel have to be involved. And I assume that Israel will have to intervene because if we don't want to see deployment of Iranian proxies along of our borders, we have to operate there. It's better to do it with coordination with the Jordanians. We have very good strategic relations with Jordan today, and we coordinate the activity in the southern part of Syria. But even without Jordan, Israel have to do something in order to keep, and uh, you know, we have interest. And we have uh, to do the things that we have to do in order to, to fulfill our interest and our uh, objectives there. Thanks, Udi. I want to sort of push back a little bit on one point just and, and ask you to drill down on one question, because this is an interesting one, this question of Southwest Syria and the ceasefire there right on Israel's border. When you talk to American officials, and I've talked to a number of people who have sort of executed this strategy, they say, we have the Israelis in the room, we are talking to them too, um, our intention is not to have Iran have any kind of, to have this de-escalation zone where you know, in the southwest, which is partially controlled by, by more moderate forces like the Free Syrian Army or the Southern Front, which is sort of that group down there, um, and to keep the, the Iranians and, and, and uh, the Assad regime out. Um, but then when you talk to Israeli officials, you get incredible concern that this, no, this, this deal is leaving us out to dry. So I wonder, maybe you can um, try to just dive a little bit more on that. Why, like, do you think there's a way for the U.S. and Israel to, to overcome this, this, what seems to be a disagreement, even interestingly with the Trump administration, between the Trump administration and Israel, or, or um, like, where does this concern come from? Because it's interesting, you hear a different story in Washington sometimes. The things that you don't see are not exist. Mm -hmm. So it's better not to look. I was, uh, Thursday I was in the Golan Heights, mm -hmm. and now there is fighting in the Hadar, Hadar village, which is a... Uh, Druze village, uh, adjacent to the Hermon mountain in the Golan Heights. And now Assad, with Hezbollah and other forces, will try, try to take over this area. They use the, you know, the helicopters with barrel bombs and all those things, okay? They are, so this is along the border. This is not far away. This is not 40 kilometer, okay? So there is activity, there is activity. We can see some of those uh, Iranian proxies in Kunetra, which is uh, under Assad control. Now there is very clever activity which they try to, to build up a, a unit, which is combination of Syrian armed forces together with Iranian proxies, Quds Force, never mind what will be the type of that. But it's, not, it's going to be mixed organization which the aim of that organization is to fight in the Golanites. So we see that picture on the, on the ground. We don't, we don't have time to wait. And that's the reason why Israel speaks a lot about the situation there. And as I said before, I assume that we don't have any other opportunity. If we see that there is deployment very close to the border, we have to operate against those elements. We have to remember something which is, which is, this is the key story today. This is the key story for the US, this is the key story from the Russians, the Iranian, and for Israel. Israel is the only one which can, uh, uh, let's say, dismantle Assad regime. The project of Syria, of Russian Assad, the project of Iran Assad, is in the Israeli hands. So in the Middle East, I said before, the, the, the damage capabilities is the most important language. And they know that. 
they know that, that if they cross the line, Israel can topple down Assad regime in Damascus or Assad himself. And this is not the story which Iranian or the Russians would like to see. And this is a key which Israel keep in its end. Well, Kim, I see you're, you're wanting to weigh in on this. And as you do, I'm also going to ask you a question to, to follow up on some of Udi's uh, remarks, which is, I mean, uh, are we at the point where we need to be giving up on this concept of replacing the Assad regime um, and trying to negotiate some kind of political outcome? Or are we still at a point where the only long-term solution is is to, to find a, a replacement for Assad. So you already look like you were going to weigh in with other things, so do that first. And, and you know, as the moderator, you often get ignored, and if your question is, it's optional response. So. <laughs> Ilan, I would, I, would, I would not ignore you. Uh, look, um, when, you th when you think of Syria, uh, and you look at it from a distance, um, it's really easy to say there are Kurds in the north, and there's ISIS in, in uh, the the east, but one of the things uh, that I think uh, Ilan, Nick, uh, and I have had the privilege of working on together is actually taking the microscope and zooming in at another level of fidelity. The problem is that the United States is not zooming in on the problems in Syria. We're, we're at the wrong magnification level in our microscope. We're saying, oh, it's peaceful here in southern Syria because in a big hand little map way, that's what we used to say at West Point, big hand little map, that, that means you can go from Washington to New York in a millisecond. Uh, big hand little map little uh, way, what, what you actually have is just fine. But if you actually zoom in on what's going on, the reality belies the big idea uh, that uh, informs the rhetoric. And I think that is something that you need to pay attention to as a really informed uh, reader of, of policy. Um, let me actually answer Ilan's question uh, and state that uh, the United States uh, cannot tolerate uh, the Assad regime staying in power. Uh, because first and foremost, uh, it does not control Syria. It cannot control all of Syria. Uh, it does not have the military capability to do so. In fact, I would go so far as to say there is no Assad regime, there's a remnant of an Assad regime uh, that is puffed up and propped up uh, by the Iranians and by the Russians. Uh, and it is no longer uh, sovereign within its own country. Assad is a magnet for uh, the Salafi Jihadi groups such as ISIS and Al Qaeda. Uh, and a call, and his um, existence in power, as Udi was saying, is a call to mobilization for Sunni worldwide. Um, and so, for uh, the very pragmatic reason uh, that we need to de-escalate uh, the conflict in Syria and remove uh, the, it from the, the global mobilization of Sunni and Shia. Uh, and we actually have to recognize uh, that the Assad regime is a problem. It is not a partner. It is not someone with whom we can work for a long-term solution. Uh, and the more we, um, and, and we do ourselves a disservice uh, as the United States uh, by trying to walk to find a line. One of the real perceptions in the Arab world uh, is that the United States has aligned itself with Iran and the Russians against the Sunni uh, inside of Iraq and Syria. And when we listen to the leader of Al-Qaeda in Syria, he talks about this. And you know what? When he says those things, 
There's a grain of truth in what he says. We don't have a rhetorical problem. We have a reality problem. We have allowed this regime to persist for a long time. We have allowed the Russians actually uh, to exercise military power and become a belligerent. We have allowed Iran uh, to establish itself in Syria. And until and unless we actually uh, say, you know what, the Assad regime cannot stay uh, we will not partner with Russia and Iran. Uh, there is no hope uh, for diminishing the global mobilization of Sunni, and there is no hope for actually getting to a negotiated end of the settlement, which is actually what we all want to see. So I'm going to take this back over to Nick, and there's a couple of things there that I'd like you to respond to, both from Kim and from Udi. Uh, one is this perception that there is no American flag in, uh, in Syria, because I know you and I have talked a lot about this and you feel a little bit differently about it, so I'd be interested to hear your perspective of you know, what is it that we are doing in Syria that's made a sense, and what should our policy be going forward on that question, and also on this idea of you know, Assad leaving and what, what, you know, um, what should this end state for Syria look like in a political negotiation look like and how do we get there? And, and I'm not just asking you that because you and I wrote a report about that. Um, <laughs> So, Nick, anyway, if you can respond to some of those questions. Well, I'll start off um, with sort of where, what are the, where, what is the U.S. doing? Microphone. Put close to you. Close, close. I'll start off by saying, uh, what is the U.S. actually doing in Syria right now? When you look at it via the counter-ISIS campaign, the U.S. is in direct control or influence over almost 30% of Syria's territory. I mean, we have to take a step back for a second. There are more or less 2,000 U.S. service men and women inside of Syria right now with direct influence via either U.S. forces or our close partners that we built up. We handpicked and selected a force of over 50,000 fighters, of which I would say two-thirds are actually non-Kurdish, or Arab, Turkmen, Circassian, Chechen. The third that is Kurdish happens to get the most publicity has also been trained to call in airstrikes, which is a core part of our campaign plan, but is has become something larger, something more uh, robust. We have three active U.S. that they report air bases in the areas of Syria that we control. Via Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan, we've created a route that can move heavy machinery and heavy weapons into a large area of Syria. So when we think about it, we already have something that Assad and Iran value very highly, which is land. The ideology of the Ba'ath Corps that remains in Damascus demands that it reconquers all of its country. It doesn't have all of its country, as has been pointed out by my colleagues, but it has to be able to reconquer all of its country in order for it to survive. Uh, the challenge that we face is that there's a big question right now, but what does the U.S. do with the areas of Syria that it's conquered? And what does that mean in terms of having leverage or pressure on Assad, Iran, and Russia? Now, the other dynamic that's important, and so one of the things I do in my weekly, you know, my weekly work is talk to the rebels in the South, the Southern Front, as Elon alluded to. I talk to them every week, what, you know, try to get a sense of where they feel, what, what is their perception on this de-escalation zone that's been built in Southwest Syria, how do they feel about potential partnerships with Israel, for example, how do they view the situation? And the challenge is, is that they don't know what the Trump, where the Trump team intends to do. And because the Trump team hasn't signaled what it intends to do, their potential patrons, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, also haven't told them what to do. We are less than 60 days away from the flow of funding for salaries for almost 30,000 rebels, most of whom are in what we would call moderate armed opposition groups. They're more nationalists. Um, they're, they're, they aren't trying to institute an Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Muslim Brotherhood uh, type state in southern Syria. They have essentially been able to provide for their families and to hold that line against Iranian mobilized militias in the Assad regime in southwest Syria because they've received salaries. Very soon they're about to lose those salaries. And that is a real, national, that is a real security threat because if they begin to defect to more extremist groups, that will then undermine the attempt for a ceasefire plan in Syria. To take, the, to take it back a little bit, to get to Elon's question about what is the end state for Syria. I mean, the desired end state should be the Assad regime has transitioned out of power, that the IRGC militias, of which there are probably 35,000, as Kim pointed out, 
a truly multinational coalition from Central Asia and other parts of the Middle East must be withdrawn. And fundamentally, there should be no Iranian long-term permanent air, naval, and other types of bases in Western Syria. The challenge is how do you get to that? Because the almost one-third of Syria that's under U.S. control is in the wrong part of Syria. What we don't have influence over is Western Syria. And in Western Syria, the IRGC, Lebanese Hezbollah, and other actors are trying to embed themselves, root themselves there, and really make the next conflict that may happen between Israel and Hezbollah a northern conflict, where strategic depth is in Western Syria. So how do you, the, the quandary is how do you apply pressure how do you get to a point where you, know, you can get Assad out of power? And there, 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 there is the challenge. Do you do it via reconstruction? The Trump administration is actively talking about using the hundreds of billions of dollars, potentially more than that, of reconstruction costs and denying Russia and Iran the ability to tap into international financing as the next battlefield to get rid of Assad. But fundamentally, the only real way to pressure them is to deny them the ability to reconstitute all of that country. Because, because a residual U.S. force for counterterrorism purposes to stabilize areas that have been taken from ISIS not only make those areas more resistant to the return of ISIS or the infiltration of al-Qaeda, which is a major challenge, and that's what was there first, al-Qaeda before ISIS, but it also puts pressure and makes it uncomfortable for Assad and Iran. And the second layer to that question, I'd say, is the Trump administration should green light financing and funding for the moderate rebels in the South, if not weapons, which I understand because they want to support the ceasefire there, salaries. Because without those salaries, you're going to see mass defections of the only rebels that have been willing to interact with the Israelis and the Jordanians, and the only rebels that have been willing to potentially stand the line against Iran and Al-Qaeda and, Al -Qaeda and ISIS elements. I would like to, to respond. Uh, we also, of course, uh, keep a kind of conversation with those organizations. Uh, first of all, they, they are saying that uh, almost two months uh, stopped this, uh, the paying of the salaries and there is no any more delivery of weapon systems for them. And there is no any now connection between them to the U.S. administration and also U.S. aid, which... Uh, uh, assist the, pop uh, the population there in southern Syria are, are not acting anymore. Okay? This is the new policy of the administration today. You spoke about 40%. This is the desert area. No population. No population at all. You know, today, uh, 11 million are under Assad control. Six million are under uh, rebels areas, what we call the enclaves and the the Kurds area, which is the most important area, and, and, and six million ran away from Syria. This is, this is all the people of Syria, okay? In the desert, there is no real people which are living there. So this is not the influence upon the future of Syria. And the key issue now, what will be in Iraq? Because the SDF, which is the Syrian Democratic Force, 80% Kurds forces, okay? PKK, yes, PKK. They took over that area by the assistant and support by the U.S. No, now it's very interesting what will be the other day, because if the U.S. will not support them, they will, they will go back to the north, east, and we will find the Assad and the Iranian. You know, it's amazing because if you look upon the picture in Iran and in Syria, in Iran, in, in Iraq and in Syria, in Iraq the U.S. gave on trail for the Iranian, the hegemony and the influence all over. Even, even last week, you know, the situation in Kirkuk, which Shia uh, 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 militias, yes, PMU, Popular Iraqi Forces, this is Shia militias leading by Iran, took over Kirkuk and pushed back the Kurds to the north. And they, you, nobody stopped them from doing that. You know, there is a person now in the Middle East, we call him the son, Sean, Connery, Sean Connery of the Middle East. You know what is Sean Connery? 007, do you remember? These people here have to remember what is 007. So there is now a new one, new Sean Connery in the Middle East. This is Suleimani. This Suleimani is the commander of the Iranian Quds Force. This is part of the Revolutionary Guard. He's everywhere in the Middle East. 
Everywhere. If you, there is any problem, you can find Suleimani there. And after that, you can find Iranian there. Iranian forces, Iranian militias, and we will see the same in Iraq, in Deir Azul, and other places if uh, nobody will try to stop them from doing that, as we see now in Kirkuk. So this is the big problem, and this is the reason what I said in the beginning, that the, in the language of the Middle East, there is betrayal by the U.S., because U.S. don't support anymore the Free Syrian Army, which was the moderate, you know, what is the moderate in this language, never mind, but the moderate rebels in Syria, they stopped doing that. Uh, there is now the story of the Kurds in Kurdistan and in northeast uh, Syria, we will have to see. And, 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 and you know, and the U.S. give the Russian open, you know, book to do what they would like to do there. Nobody tried to stop them from doing things. And this is not the way to achieve stability and something better in the future in Syria. This is not the way to stop the revolutionary guard influence all over the Middle East. This is, now there is a policy. Uh, at least somebody said that the, revolution, the Iranian revolutionary guard, this is the main now a negative force in the Middle East and somebody has to stop them from achieving influence all over. This is not the way to block them to stop them from doing that. So I'm going to ask one last question, maybe of, of Nick and Kim a little bit, and then if people want to, we'll have a few minutes for, for Q&A. I think we'll have a roving microphone, is that right? Um, uh, so, so prepare your questions, um, and maybe we'll take a few questions at a time. But the last, just I want to hear from Nick and Kim a response on this, on this issue of Kirkuk, because this whole thing is very, very, very complex if we haven't gotten, if, if that message hasn't come across uh, so far with all these different actors and pieces. But, but we did have this story this week of these, um, some people would say Shia militias, other would say this is the Iraqi security forces that we've been supporting since the start of the conflict. Like, is this really a win for Iran? Is this about internal so now, Iraqi now politics? Somebody it's sent me now pictures of Kirkuk. All the flags are yellow. Mm -hmm. Well, let me hear from Kim and... and, and Nick on, on responding on some of these questions. And also it is interesting because Udi makes the point that that um, that this is that the Trump administration has said that, you know, the pushing back on Iran's regional behavior is the centerpiece of their strategy. So how do you let something like Kirkuk happen if that's the centerpiece of your strategy? Um, look, I think first uh, we look, we haven't said it yet in this panel, but Iraq and Syria are actually uh, important components of U.S. Uh, security within the Middle East. Uh, these places are important. Uh, and the survival of these states is important. Uh, for a very long time, in fact, from uh, through the Bush administration and the Obama administration, the United States has supported a unitary Iraq, uh, one single state in Iraq, recognizing uh, that um, it is important actually to retain the integrity of, of the states uh, within the Middle East as soon as somebody gets to determine his own borders by force rather than through international agreement or diplomacy, uh, then that state actually sets off uh, a series of uh, disputes throughout the region and throughout the world. It's what made ISIS so dangerous uh, as an organization was that it was claiming actually uh, to be its own state state and to be breaking down state borders and revamping the international order. So when we approach uh, the problem of Iraq right now, uh, we have certainly a very long uh, historical and understandable dispute uh, between the Arabs in Iraq uh, and the Kurds in Iraq. Um, and uh, with an incredibly uh, violent history. Uh, but what the United States must focus on is actually making sure that there is a unitary Iraq uh, and that no party actually unilaterally declares itself independent. Unfortunately, uh, the Iraqi 
Kurds chose a moment in late September uh, to hold a referendum unilaterally to declare their independence. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, in fact, all countries with a substantial uh, Kurdish uh, minority population uh, decided, no, this can't stand, uh, united together to put pressure uh, on the Iraqi Kurds uh, to make it stop. Um, and in fact, uh, both the Iraqi security forces and the Iranian-backed uh, militias that fight alongside with them moved into uh, areas that had long been disputed between Arabs and Kurds, but were held by the Kurds since ISIS, Kurds since ISIS came in 2014. It is undoubtedly important uh, to push back uh, on the Iranian influence inside of Iraq uh, and not to uh, play ostrich. Uh, not to pretend that these Iranians aren't there. I mean, U.S. forces have said there are no Iranians uh, here in northern, in, in, in this part of Iraq. That's not true. Um, we, we can see them through social media. Uh, they are there. We have, to, we have to, on the one hand, recognize that there is a legitimate Iraqi state, but uh, that it is now time for the U.S. to uh, get the Iranian forces out, and we do that first and foremost by recognizing that they're there uh, rather than pretending that they aren't. So I'm going to actually take us to questions, um, and we sorry we only have a few minutes for questions because uh, we basically ran a little late. Um, but why don't we do is take three or four questions and then sort of go through. We'll do one round of questions, and please actually. Phrase your question in the form of a question, a short question, not a long statement, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, Hezbollah. Uh, we've talked with, uh, about them, of course, being a proxy for the Iranians. But instead of being a defensive force, they've now demonstrated strong offensive capability and the ability to move in several places, not only in the Lebanese border, but in southwestern Syria. Is taking Hezbollah out or creating a military effort so strong as to deter them or convince them that it's not worthwhile, the method of then going on to the IRG and the others and saying, this and no farther. Will anyone be accountable for crimes against humanity? You have Assad with his chemical weapons or the ISIS genocide of the Yazidis. I, I, I. Okay. So uh, my question is for General Dackel. You mentioned that in your opinion, uh, one point of leverage which Israel has against Russia and Iran is the ability to destroy the Assad regime. And so I'm interested to know what resultant situation, in the event that Israel acted in such a way, what resultant situation would beneficially be the same or better for Israel to demonstrate that that is, in fact, a point of leverage? Can I say one more? Could we, could we get a, uh, is this on? Could we, could we get a um, uh, response on uh, the role of, of Turkey in Syria? I mean, I heard... Ms. Kagan say, if I heard correctly, that they are surreptitiously uh, sort of in cahoots with Al-Qaeda? Okay, so we have questions about Turkey, Hezbollah, uh, crimes against humanity, and, um, uh, and, and toppling Assad. So um, why don't we start with Udi, go, then Nick and Kim, and everybody's going to have to keep their answers relatively limited, and then we'll close. I will take the easy questions and you will get the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, about Hezbollah. Hezbollah, the problem that today this is the all, or almost military, the uh, let's say, a military force with the better capabilities than the other military forces of the states uh, all over the Middle East. Because they got from Iran thousands of missiles, now with the better precise capabilities, and UAVs, attack UAVs, and other means, which give them a lot of uh, ability to attack Israel, especially 
to hit the center of population in Israel and strategic locations in Israel. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, big security challenge for Israel. Uh, as we see now the picture, uh, they are focused upon the situation in Syria. That's the reason that why there is no escalation between us and Hezbollah. And second, because of, you know, everybody speak about Second Lebanon War, but there is some positive uh, influence of the Second Lebanon War because of the deterrence. They understood what kind of damage we can create to Lebanon. You know, uh, our Minister of Defense was, uh, almost a year ago, there is a, a, a conference, a defense cons conference in Germany, in Munich, in Germany. And a day before the conference, Nasrallah spoke about Dimona and Ammonia. You know what is the meaning, Dimona? It's attacking the nuclear center of Israel in Dimona, and Ammonia is a location of Ammonia in, in Haifa. And he said now that he has the capabilities to hit those places. And I, I sent an idea to our minister. He didn't uh, take my uh, advice <laughs> uh, to, to, you know, in, during the conference to put a map on the table that everybody all over the world will see. We know all the villages, all the villages in, in Lebanon, which they are military locations because Hezbollah put the rockets, the launchers, in indoor area, inside the houses of people. They gave people money to build up buildings, but they put the launchers inside the buildings. And we have the picture, very nice picture. And uh, to say only one thing, if there is a launching of uh, rockets or missiles toward Israel, we are going to destroy all of those military locations. This is not civilian targets. This is military locations. But our minister decided that it's not good to say that in the international forum. Uh, so uh, I assume that the Le Lebanese understand, and especially Hezbollah and the Lebanese people, which have some kind of influence. Even Hezbollah is a terror organization. They are playing in the, in the, politica, in the political uh, yard, and they have to take into consideration uh, the public opinion. And the public in Lebanon don't want to be part of a new war with Israel. So there is restrictions on Hezbollah. But fighting against us, from the Syrian territory, it's more, it's more easy, because this is not Lebanon. This is the problem of the Syrians. This is one question. Sure. The, other, the second right. one was Just about, the one that was directed. about, about I, I will answer about, uh, I, I agree with you. You know, the, the, the main problem today is the outcome and what we call uh, unintended consequences, because you try to do something and you get a uh, worse situation. And that we have to take into consideration because I agree in any case which we attacking Assad, Hezbollah will, as we spoke about Hezbollah, will initiate, escalate the situation from Lebanon because today for us, Lebanon and Syria, this is one arena. This is not separate. This is one arena and we have to take into consideration. So this is kind of risk that you have to take if, before you are doing something. What will be the implications of your activity. If you believe that it's more important to achieve that goal, so you have to take the risk. If you're afraid of risk, uh, so you don't do anything. And don't do anything, we heard about what is the meaning of doing anything. So Nick, if you... So, so I'll go through each one very quick. Well, maybe, maybe when we're just, let's look at maybe Turkey and, and um, anything. Maybe we just talk Turkey and also crimes against humanity, because okay. we only literally have two so or three minutes here. In regard here. to crimes against humanity, there's a large body of evidence that's being collected by a range of international organizations and the UN and national government. Oh. Oh, and, <laughs> thank you. And national governments um, in regard to Assad's crimes, as well as ISIS and the Yazidis. Two quick points. The problem with Assad is, and as I talk in my armed opposition folks that I talk to, they're convinced Assad is not going to be brought to justice for his crimes so long as he sits in Damascus and so long as Russia and Iran back him. And so they are convinced Assad will only be brought to justice. It's not the justice they want, is by being, by being taken out physically or assassinated. When it comes to ISIS and the Yazidis, the issue is that so many of those crimes that were committed by the Yazidis were committed by their neighbors, by the Sunni communities that they live next to. And there's a range of Iraqis that 
facilitated ISIS to do that, and it's very difficult, and that falls in the range of communal reconciliation, and that can really only be, be baked in to a larger process of Iraqi communal reconciliation, and there's no political will right now because they're trying to get the buy-in of the Sunni community for that to be achieved. But the hope is down the line, some of the worst ISIS offenders that are foreign fighters can be prosecuted, but when it comes to the local Iraqi Sunnis that facilitated them, I'm, I'm not as confident. When it comes to Turkey, right now Turkey controls uh, a piece of Syria that is the size of Rhode Island. By the end of their Idlib off offensive uh, that Kim talked about, they could have a piece of Syria the size of Delaware. They are not going away. Turkey knows that the territory it controls with the consent of Russia is very important for it. And Erdogan himself has Ottoman-type visions to have a Turkish role in northern Syria and northwest Iraq. So Kim, you, you, just over to you, if there's any last words on the panel or any, any meta thing you would want anybody to take out of this before we uh, finish? Sure. The, the case of Syria is one where the U.S. pragmatic national security requirements and U.S. moral national security requirements actually align. Uh, and so the path forward actually should be clear whether you're a pragmatist uh, or whether you're an idealist. Uh, and that actually should make it easier rather than harder to formulate strategy. Okay. Well, that's, I think, a good reminder for all of us. Um, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to close this panel. First, I'd like you to take a moment to thank our, uh, our panelists for a really good discussion. So uh, I think we... We barely even scratched the surface. There's so much complexity to this question. We barely even got into the Russians and all kinds of other things. Now, here, there's going to be another panel in 10 minutes on Israel's relationship with the Arab world. Upstairs in 10 minutes, we're going to have a panel on uh, Iran. Uh, and so thanks very much for joining and uh, hope to see you up there, one of those two. Thanks.